So here, I've got another thing to test some sigling. It's always a capacitor shirt, interesting some much. Anyway, this has been on loan to me from Rob. Haven't played with it yet, not really, only when he first dropped it off. Let's get this thing out of the box and we'll see what we're talking about. It's a pretty big box. Uh, it's just too damn big. Right, first let's have a look inside this box. Of course, I only do unboxing videos, right? <laughs> That's not going to get old soon. Here's a clue. Scope probe. Another scope probe. Another scope probe. Oh, and another scope probe. We have a mouse. We have something else which Rob has shown me, which I think we're playing with. Power cable, USB, B cable, standard stuff. Uh, quick start guide and this is what's in it STS 6000A series oscilloscope this is what all this is for what's in the envelope calibration certificate actually has some data on it, that's nice it all looks what you should expect under here. Oh, nothing. No goodies, no chocolates. <laughs> it's a massive thing. This has been lent to me by Rob of Tapaka Technology, if in New Zealand. If you want to check out totech.co.nz. So it's just on loan. I'd love to keep this, but not really likely to have anything. So I've got hardcover protection for the screen. That's nice. Used to see that on like the Roden Swartz, stuff like that. Look at this beast. Massive. You've got dual USBs on the front, you've got MSO input here. Obviously you've got auto sensing on the channel, stuff like that as well. Single control for vertical, which means you've got to select which channel you want to use on the controls. Digital control, reference, math, waveform stuff. Horizontal controls, zoom functions, position controls as usual. Got zoom here as well. Decoding here. History button. Navigate, search, wave generator, display button, safe recall, utility, sort of standard buttons you get on signal scopes. Single auto setup and normal for the trigger stuff. Also adjustment levels, universal control, cursor button, measurement, printing, touch, which means you can turn the screen touch on and off. Auto setup button, default, which is obviously factory default setting or whatever default setup you choose to use in that button. Clear sweeps and a run stop button. That's the physical controls. Also got calibration thing and dual USBs and you know the usual stuff there. Vent down the side here. More USBs on the back here. You got dual USBs here. You got USB, Ethernet port, HDMI output, auxiliary output, external trigger, got micro SD port in here. Interesting. Uh, obviously AC power coming in there. Different frequencies, so it can actually support 400 hertz. Just loads of vents on this side. Tilting feet, you can tilt it back if you want. As you can see we've got a rather ugly screen protection on here. We'll have to do something about that. Another thing of note, it's the SDS6204A, which is the 2 gigahertz scope. 2 gig! I can probably test that. Well, I think before we do anything, we're going to have to take the screen protector off. We have to do the pill. I've got the tweezers ready. Are you ready for this? The little tabs here. Ready? Don't get too excited. Oh yeah, that's much better. Specs, I'm not going to read you out the specs, right? If you want to know the specs of a piece of equipment, download the manual, look at the specification data sheet, whatever it may be, Read it yourself. I'm not going to sit here boring in the video, reading out numbers to you in the video. You know, lots of other people do that. I'd rather show you the user interface and show you what you'll find when you go to use it and have a look at it in the real world because you don't get that from the manual. The information about specifications, you can get that from the manual. I will 
do verifications of some things, like the bandwidth and stuff like that, I'll just check those, see how they actually pan out. I'm more interested in user interface and showing you how it will actually function and how you'll find the usage of it. That's what I'm interested in showing you. Numbers and all the specs, I would rarely say anything about them, apart from maybe the main banner spec, like 2 gigahertz, or the number of samples it can do, and that sort of stuff. All right. Just to be clear on that, and this is not an unboxing video. So let's just unbox these the oscilloscope probes. So I'm just going to do one probe. This one needs setting up, so I'm just going to unbox this one. So the probes it comes with are 500 megahertz passive probes, a bunch of accessories. I will actually look at the specs on the probes. There's no switches on these, so these are fixed 10 times probes, 10 picofarad capacitance, 10 mega ohms, bandwidth 500 megahertz, as I said, rise time is 0.7 nanoseconds. 1.3 meters long. Um, conversations from 10 to 20 picofarad. So these are rated at cap 2 400 volts RMS. That's the only specs I'm going to tell you. Okay, about the probes. So the probe itself has got this little cap on it, like this, just to protect it. Okay, that's nice. They're actually quite stubby probes, they're quite short, obviously because of the bandwidth and stuff like that. We look in the probe kit. What do we get? Obviously, you've got a clip on tip. We have the adjustment screwdriver. We have a BNC adapter, spring probe. We have a insulated probe tip, replacement tip, and we have another insulating cover. So I'm going to fit the clip probe because that's what I'm going to be using, and that's a nice positive clip on there actually when it goes on. It's a nice reassuring little click. It feels like it's on there very nicely. That's good. It feels like it's a quality probe. Okay, so I have a power cable connected. Let's turn the power on, and we have a soft power button over here, which is glowing green, no pulsing. My light's drowning out so you'll be able to see it on camera. Right, let's turn it on, see how long it takes to boot up. I'll start it on 30 seconds. You probably can't see that anyway. 30 seconds, there we go. Fan ramped up to start off with. Probably can't see that, can you? Can't see the second hand? No, you maybe can. 15. So that's about 45 seconds to boot up. Just a couple of little things there. 50 seconds? It called it 50 seconds. There we go. I think it's finished now. Oh, no. There we go. A bit more. 55 seconds. Okay. Got waveform. Everything's on the screen. 55 seconds to boot. That's a fairly long time, but obviously it's got a lot going on in the background there. This isn't the usual scope after all. Now, the screen is actually fine in this ambient environment. I can see the screen just fine. There's no issues with brightness or anything like that. This is a touch screen. Now because I've got this bright lighting here to do recording, it is going to make it look worse on camera. So what I'm going to try and do first is actually make it a bit brighter. So LCD brightness, we should wind it up. And then we'll make, let's go 90%. I never like to run things at maximum. So that makes it a little bit brighter for screen. You should be able to see it slightly better on camera now. Things to notice, this MSO port here. This uses the same MSO probe as the 2000X Plus does. Now it's the same one. I think maybe the same as the 5000 as well. That one which I built for my 2000 will work on this one too. So if you own one of those probes from an earlier generation scope, like the like I've got the 2000X Plus, right? That Logic probe, you can use it on this one as well. So you don't have to buy a new probe to use a scope. That's quite a nice feature. I do like it's got the auto sensing and things like that on here. The scope itself has an auto sensing pen to say it's a times 10 probe. Standard basic pens goes into the outer shield. So if you've ever used any of the more modern silicon scopes, you might recognise the interface. To me, this is really familiar. It is very similar to my 2104X Plus. All the touchscreen stuff, menus, all the same. It's all there. Just the same. Alright, so this is all really familiar. No difference really in usage to the other scopes, so it should be basically really easy to pick up. Eye diagram? Hmm. Does eye diagrams. Cool. Never used eye diagrams. 
So this one I'm going to check one first and change the probes. This probe says one times already, so let's change that. It's also got one mega ohm, 50 ohm impedance selection. I can hear relay clicking. So this actually has a 50 ohm load inside it to do that loading, which is great. Better scopes have that. So what I'm going to do now is plug in this probe onto channel 1. Don't forget this is a 10 times probe, so a fixed probe level. So they should detect that and change over. There we go, 10 times probe. Easy. So obviously this is the first time this probe has been used, so I've actually hooked up for the calibration port on the front. And you can see we've got a little bit of uh, undershoot on the waveform here. Not surprising. So let's get the actual probe. Now this actual has the calibration on the plug of the probe, not the other end. And then this has actually got three calibration points. I'm just going to do the one which is currently open because that should be the one we need to do. It has obviously high frequency calibrations as well on the actual probe because they're needed to compensate for that. So let's just do this one which should be all we need to do. And I have lost the trigger. Well, I've lost the trigger. Oh, just did a calibration. Okay, interesting. Didn't hear me talking about calibrations. <laughs> so I'm just doing compensation of the probe, all right? So that's looking pretty good there. Sometimes changing the time base can show up the slope slightly better as well. You can see it's got a little bit of a downward slope there. All right, so I always go up and down with the time base there to change that to try and get the best overall. That there somewhere, I suppose, is kind of optimal, and we we'll go longer and see how that comes out. And that's going up a very slight overshoot there. I think that's probably close enough. There's a compromise between the time bases. So because this thing does have all these USB ports on it, these actually support a keyboard and mouse interface. So it does have a, a Bluetooth dongle in there to do the mouse. The mouse is in this box. I'm not going to use it because it's right in front of me, but I do use it on my own scope because it's on the top of my shelf here. And it's a bit of, you know, it's basically outside of arm's reach. In that case, using a mouse or a keyboard is brilliant. But as this is right in front of me, I'm not going to bother with that today. It's useful to know that you can actually do that. But if it's right in front of your arm's reach, it's quicker to just do with your hands on the screen, on the controls directly, rather than with the mouse. Your own preference may vary. So we've got the utility button down here, which is going to bring up the menu. We also have the utility over here as well, which also allows you to bring up the menu. All right, so you can do it in two different places. System info, let's have a look at that first. Hollow version 0102, FPGA version, this is April of 22. System settings, so you've got languages, um, there's a bunch in there as always is, reference positions, um, delay and position. So I actually prefer to have position. If you move the cursor off here, or well, move the trigger point off to say over here somewhere, like that, and then you change the time base, your trigger point doesn't shift across the screen, it's always where you expect it to be, right? This is how I prefer to use it myself anyway. Screensaver off, touch screen is on, it's got control here to turn the touch screen off, right? Now you can't turn it back on again, but you also have the button over here, which means you can turn it back on. Beeper, I prefer that so you can hear the touches. Auto power on, enable disabled, don't really need to worry about that. Date time setting, and we come back out of there now. IO options, so LAN configuration, automatic means DHCP, um, obviously it'll set up stuff for whatever you want to do, and it's also got DNS options which is interesting, and VNC. Um, web server options, it does have a web server, which means you can remotely access this using the Siglant software, I'm not going to go into that right now. Net storage, just got that as well, I haven't played with that and I'm not going to play with that. Emulation, then non tetronics let's get rid of that. Um, oh, I've just got rid of it. IO setting, emulation, tetronics and none. Not quite sure what the difference is there. LXI as well, it's got information there for talking to the right LXI. Okay, software options, so it's all the options. This one's fully optioned, really nice. So, your uh, frequency generator. Signal Channel Logic Analyzer, Flex Ray, CAN, I2S, 1453B, PA, which is Power Analysis, SENT, Manchester, EJ, I'm not sure what EJ is. Um, and then we've got Maintenance, Menu stuff, which I'm not going to go into, I don't think too much, but Self Calibration, Upgrades, Developer Options, which requires a password to go into, 
and self-test. So we're fairly self-explanatory. I'm going to go into those. So that's the utility menu. Plenty more to go. In the utility menu over here, we've got menu, which we've been looking at. Save recall options, saying save setups, or screen captures, or CSVs, or whatever. And you can also recall the same things too. We also have wave gen. Now, as you saw, we have the wave gen option enabled, but please connect the AWG module. Now, did you notice there was no AWG BNC port on this thing? It's obviously using an external AWG. So you have to plug that into a USB port, I'm guessing. Signal do still a wave gen. You can pull into a SDG series generator, or wherever you have to use those other ones, those standalone ones. Use some of the other scopes, I'm not quite sure. Hot menu, print, reboot, shut down. So we'll help over here. So if you want to go into any aspects of it, basically it's a built-in manual which you can scroll through and stuff and look at the various sections and tells you how to set it up and wave you. Interest it says SGS 5000X. Uh, this isn't a 5000, this is a 6000. I'm guessing it's the same software, so it probably doesn't matter, but Signal should probably fix the built in naming. <laughs> How do I go back? Hmm. Okay, well, close it. There's that menu done. Display menu, we kind of popped in here before as well when we did the brightness adjustment. So you've got the main menu, which is down the side here, which is what we play with, the LCD brightness, bring it up more. The graphical brightness, which I think I will increase to make it slightly more obvious on camera. You'll probably see it slightly better there. Gone too far probably, eh? Oh, that's, that's really touchy. So it's got velocity control, but it's really sensitive. Don't turn it too quick. So that's the side menu we kind of looked at before, so vectors and dots are so quite important setting sometimes. Sometimes you actually want to see where the samples are. No difference here. This thing's got a lot of samples going on. <laughs> also got things like embedded menu and floating menu. So floating just means it pops over the top and it will disappear again. Embedded actually shifts things over sideways instead to make room for it. I don't mind the floating one actually, because it does get back out of the way again. Um, you can also hide it like that if you want. There's also, you can see there's a scroll bar here. It's not so obvious, but there's a little blue line down here. Which means you can slide it up and there's some more stuff. So keypad brightness, which we can't see on camera, but it is actually back illuminated. Yeah, there's like various buttons are illuminated. You can see that one's lit up, but my lighting here drowns that out. That's all you're at 80%. I'm going to leave it alone. Color schemes, access labels, so you can turn labels on and off. It tells you the actual points on the graphical. That can be quite nice. All right, so that moves the graphical with the trigger points and reference points. Hmm, okay. So can I break that? No, that, re that defaults properly, so there's no bug there, that's good. Send it back off, leave it standard for now. Okay, that's that stuff. Next menu. So, a car menu. Menu here, down the side. So interpolation, acquisition mode, fast, slow, acquisition, normal. Peak detect average and high res, depending on which functions you are set up at the time. Um, it will enable certain ones, so that's what it's learning right now. Memory management, auto, fixed sample rate, fixed memory. This is a little bit different. So what this does, it manages your memory in a different way. Now normally what will happen is you have a fixed sample rate and your memory will expand and contract depending on your horizontal time base or how many channels you've got running and that sort of stuff. Memory depth, 500 mega samples. That's not bad, is it? If you do fixed sample rate, now we've got 10 giga samples. Bit of a difference there. So let's step down and actually see what we get. So 10 gig, 5 gig, 1, 500, 250, and downwards from that, right? Um, and also your sample rates go quite low, which means you can do some quite long recordings on this thing. The other thing of that, this also relates to how much you can see on screen. So normally when you're capturing, what you have on screen, maybe plus a little bit more, that's what's there. Also, I'll sort of show you this while I'm thinking about it. Horizontal scale. 1,000 seconds per division. That's a long recall time. And it'll go all the way up the other way. 100 picoseconds per division. So a little trick with this, which I'm sure you will find useful. If you're on fixed sample rate, and you're running, and you push stop, so you stop acquisition, normally if you try to zoom out, you'd be really limited about what you can see, right? That's what you have. Basically, what was on the screen, plus a little bit more. That's fairly typical. You'd usually... 
have to be like zoomed out as much as you can catch as much as you can and then zoom in to see the detail right this can be done differently on a scope so if you go to instead you have to run it first if you go to fixed menu management you got that 500 megs again now if I do the same test on this I'll zoom back into about the same level I think it's about there wasn't it I'll stop it and I'll zoom out there's still some there and we've got 10 milliseconds of vision, so it's about 50 milliseconds there. Okay. You think that's alright? And that's from 200 microseconds per division. Okay, let's go in a bit further. So if I go into say, hmm, how about 1 nanosecond per division? Then we'll stop it. And then we'll zoom out. We're still going. And that is, again, 50 milliseconds worth of data. That's pretty cool. So I've now turned on all four channels. So let's see if we can do the same thing again with all four channels running. We've still got different memory depth though. We've got 125 megs now. So that's dropped a little bit. So what did we go down to before? Was it... Um, I'll just pick a second there. Um, what did we go down to before? Was it 1 nanosecond? I think it was, wasn't it? 1 nanosecond. Let's do exactly the same test. Stop it. Bring it back in. Okay, that's come down a bit. What we at now? We're at five milliseconds for division. So we've now got about twelve milliseconds instead, because our memory depth is now one twenty-five. Because we've got all four channels running. Okay, not unexpected because it is shared. If I turned off, say channel, um, let's turn off channel two and channel four. Let's leave, leave channel three running. Back to the core menu. Run it again. Memory depth is now 250, which means we should get 25 milliseconds available to us. So if I just bring this in a bit, stop it, bring it back out, 10 milliseconds of addition, there we go, 25, as expected. So other things we've got here, sequence, so sequence memory, all right, segmented memory. I don't actually tend to use that myself, but yeah, okay. ESR, I don't actually know what ESR is. It's probably in the manual, go read it. XY mode, service boundary. That's that menu. Also over here in natural list, we have roll mode, clear sweeps, run, stop, auto, setup, and default, which is stuff that's over here anyway. Just another way of getting to it. So let's do a zoom, shall we? Let's oh, zoom out a bit more like that. Acquire, zoom, and we can zoom out. There we go. Gives us the full sample here, and there's the bit we want to look at. Loads of detail. It's impressive. And there's also a button for that over here. Trigger menu, auto signal normal options, zone trigger, nice standard stuff here. Different types of trigger, edges, slopes, pulses, video, window, interval, dropout, run to pulses, patterns, serial data, that's always handy. Qualified, which is an interesting one. Nth edge, so it counts how many pulses, but then it will trigger. Delayed, trigger, and set up and hold. Trigger sources, obviously. Rising, folding, alternating, hold off, none, events and time. Events is interesting. Okay. And time is standard time based stuff. I might show you that a bit later on. Coupling, AC, DC, low frequency, high frequency with jets, standard stuff. And zone triggering, means if you want to tell it to sort of trigger in there, then you can tell it, you obviously set that up with that. I I think that's a pretty cool thing. If you've got a thing which is being hard to trigger on, you can use zone triggering to try and capture it. And obviously that trigger menu is accessible from over here as well. It's by pushing the setup button. And also you've got the quick controls here as well to get straight to those some of those options. Alright, cursors. Cursors, not curses. Menu over here. Cursors are now on. And the thing about touch screens is it actually makes using cursors much easier. So let's zoom in a bit. Yeah, cursors are great when you've got um, a touch screen or mouse control right? if you're using a mouse that'd also be really easy right so if you want to you know measure that time for frame there between there and here you know, if I go to that one there instead that'll be closer yeah basically one kilohertz you can probably barely see that on camera cursors x2 x1 tracking cursors that's all standard stuff 
So X1 source, X2 source, both from channel 1. So you can actually do off different channels if you want to. Um, fix the following, yeah, that's all that stuff. So, and not standard measurement ones. Measure item, no. Which is always helpful. I think that's the cursor as well, is it? Anything else in there? That's the X type. You've got Y type as well, if you want to do vertical. Um, and X and Y, if you want to do both. So, there is displayed there automatically. Yeah, I don't tend to use cursors myself, so I just have on screen measurements, which we'll get to next in here. So, menu, let's look at that first. So, measurements. I actually like this setup quite nicely because it's just below the screen. We've got enough screen real estate, and you can see most of the important stuff you want to look at. Um, that's a simple setup. You can also do the advanced one which gives you options for what types of stuff you have instead. you got lots of stuff in here. These are favourites. Vertical options. Turn RMS on. Add that one. Horizontal options. Periods. Duty cycle maybe. Miscellaneous ones. This is loads in here. Skew, phase. There's loads. That's obviously the advanced one. Simple one is just the basic stuff you're probably going to use, and it's there. But if you don't need a lot of this stuff, then you could just not worry about it. Choose the advanced one, choose what you actually want to use. Keep the clutter down. They also have this config here amplitude strategy, auto and manual, histogram max, histogram min. Okay. Thresholds, so you can set the tolerances up for that. Gating. So any samples in a certain section, turn it off, okay, nice. And obviously the source channel we're going to do measurements on. If you want to do measurements across multiple channels, you can go in and turn them on on individual ones. And obviously in the top measure here, we've got the simple and advanced options right there, so you go straight into them without having to go in and toggle things over here. See, most of this stuff is exactly the same as on my 2000X Plus scope. Very similar stuff. So math, function 1, function 2, function 3, you can choose which functions you're going to do, what kind of math you're going to do on it. Let's do FFT. And there's an FFT hiding under there. So that's that basic menu there. And configuration, 2 mega points. You could do up to 8 mega points if you want. Rectangle, Backman, Hanging, Hemming and Flat Top, standard stuff. Display, split display or full screen or exclusive. Um, FFT mode, normal, max hold or averaging, okay, all standard stuff. Now they can see as I'm showing the across here, but you've also got soft buttons over here as well, you know, you've got the math button here, got the measure button up there, cursor button there, so you can go straight in off the front panel or up here, so you've got options of how you get in there. So what I'm doing right now is booting up my 2000X Plus, and I just want to compare the analysis menu between mine and this unit to see what difference there is. So I have on mine, I've got search, navigate, history, decoding, mask, test, bow plot, or body plot, you want to pronounce it, power analysis, and counter. So this has DVM, histogram, eye diagram, and jitter, which my 2000X Plus does not have. So this is the search function here, I just did that in search, right? Um, set up menu, sources, kind of slopes, and what have you. Copy for trigger, copy two trigger, cancel copy, and one key navigate. I still haven't actually used them mine, to be honest, I don't know if much familiarity with it. Navigation by time, so you can skip through frames. It's using segmented memory options basically. History is all the triggers, and you choose which ones you want to go to, how many you actually have, um, interval times, and that sort of stuff. Right. Decoding, which is also a button over here. Just turn decode on. Um, you can have a results list, turn it on, bus one, there we go. So it'll actually give you a list of all decoding, which is found here. Obviously I'm not doing decoding right now, so you won't see anything. So, I'll turn it back off for now. Um, bus operation is on, obviously bus one. Bus display, the position you can move up and down. So, ASCII, hex, decimal and binary, standard formats. All of them are very useful. Protocol. These are in protocols, this one's currently enabled with, well, it has all of them. 
So these are the ones which are available. Uh, I think I2C, SPI, UART, CAN, and LEN. I think those are the defaults. And these all these other ones down here were options. I think I've got that right. Protocol signals, so you can choose the signal levels and stuff like that. Configuration options. Not this is on the board for this particular one because it's on LEN. Let's do a SPI option. And we'll look at this one instead. It'll give us the channel we're going to use to the thresholds and what have you for each channel. You know what inputs you're going to be using, basically, right? So you can configure those as you require them. Maybe using MSO port on the, on the bottom instead, not just the analog channels. You can do it that way, and also other stuff here. Basic configuration stuff, as you always get with decoding. Um, they're all the same kind of thing, really. Another thing we've got mask test here. I'm not familiar with this, again, haven't used it. This will output, I believe, a signal on the back there. So with the mask thing, I've got no idea about that. <laughs> I'd say look it up in the manual, read it. It's obviously for pass file output, stuff like that. Top of file, or usual functions. I don't use this myself, so back off. DVM. So you have a voltage measurement over here. Um, let's see. Averaging. RMS, AC RMS, peak to peak amplitude. I mean, these are things which you get down here anyway. Do oh, you really need it? <laughs> hmm. Auto ranging. Oh, that's interesting. Right, auto scale to display. Bars, oh, there we go. That's more useful. Larger display. Histogram. Also very useful. Trend plot. Very useful also. So these are very much like functions on my Siglent SDN3065X. It has certainly these two, obviously it's got the basic display as well, but the uh, trend chart is very helpful to see what's going on over a period of time. So it's drifting or a bit of noise in it, that sort of stuff. Very good for that. And also histogram seeing if you've got something which is out of control, jumping around rapidly. You may you see it on here too, but it's good for seeing my binning I suppose. And hold as well. Which stops everything. Nice. That is actually quite useful features. So initially it's like, oh what do you need that for? But actually no this is quite good. Close it off again. Turn it back off. I just wish that feature was on my 2000 X plus to be honest. Body plot, it has a feature Obviously I'm not doing any kind of testing. I think I've only done body plots once to demonstrate it once when I had a scope I was reviewing. It's not something I use, it's not something I tend to run to when I'm doing diagnostics. It just doesn't come up as something I need to do. So I'm not that familiar with body plots to be honest. I know you need a generator and to test stuff and like that, but yeah, it's just not something I do. So I can't really actually tell you that much about that. Power analysis. I have played with this a little bit on my mother scopes because I do have that feature enabled and it can be handy. Different tests you can do, power quality, current harmonics, in rush current, switching loss, slew rate, modulation, output ripple, nice one to know, turn on off, transient responses, PSSR, I don't know what that is, efficiency and SOA, which also I don't know what that is. In rush current and ripple are probably be the two that I'd probably be most interested in out of all those. Again, I've got it on my other scope. Haven't really used it that much. I mean, I've done it manually. I should probably use this system. <laughs> it's built in. Turn it back off. Histogram. Okay, so it's telling you averages, but this kind of gives you that information anyway. Counter. So you've got Fuzzy Counter up here. Which you also have up here already, and you can also have it down here. So I don't know why you'd really worry about it. Statistics, so maybe that'd be more interesting. Yep, there we go. So then you can see a bit more information about the actual min, maximum frequency, and and stuff like that. So that that could certainly be more useful. I diagram. I've got no experience with I diagrams. Obviously, I've seen them demonstrated on places like uh, the Signal Path. Sharia. This isn't something I have any experience with. I can't tell you much about it. I just know they exist. And then we've got just analysis down the bottom here as well. Let's 
see what this is doing. This is a new thing for me, not seen it before, and it's not really showing as much at the moment. Wave? No? no. I don't know. <laughs> Clock recovery? I don't know how to use this at all, obviously, I don't have a clue. It'll be in the manual. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm only triggering off the calibration port, don't forget, so I don't think that'll matter. Maybe it's something to do with that, which is why it's not doing much, but yeah, I don't know. Well, I think that's basically all the menus covered. That took ages, but a lot of these are in other scopes as well. So if you've got another signal scope which has got the same UI in it, they may help you understand your existing scope as well. Um, a lot of the things are in the other ones. It's quite nice to see the overlap and the fact they've got this universal system now, which is consistent across the range and across the different models. It's quite nice to see. Jump on a scope and basically use most of it without having any prior experience with it. That's really good. So let's look at the channel stuff. Let's turn on channel 1 here. Well, tap on channel 1. We've got options here for setting the scaling and the position, like the offset. Let's zero that. We currently got 50 millivolts of vision. Let's go bigger so get it back on screen. And you can also copy this to other channels which are currently turned off, so it doesn't matter. So that could be handy if you want to replicate and you want to set up. It's the same way, you just turn to each one individually. Coupling, currently on DC, do AC coupling, it'll center it. Bandwidth limits, what we got here? Full 20 meg and 200 meg. Don't forget this is a 2 gigahertz scope. We will try that soon. Probing, labels, you can actually put your own labels on them instead. Instead of, you know, just channel one, you could have input voltage or clock or whatever you may want to call it. Obviously the 1 meg going 50 ohm, which I mentioned before. Volts and amps display. De-skewing, screw up slightly, inverting, and trace visible and hidden. So if you want to hide the trace because you've got a lot going on the screen, but you still want the channel to be active, you can hide the trace itself. Obviously you can do that for all four channels. Then we've got time base down here as well. Similar sort of stuff. You can zero the time base, which I already have anyway. So it's the points in the centre here. It's all lined up nicely. And you also adjust the time base scaling there as well. Also got the car menu shortcut there too. Trigger menu, which is what we got to before from over here. Um, we've also got the options here for the setting trigger level this way instead of using the dial or 50% which is what you can also do by pushing the button on the dial. I think we've got everything done. Anything up here we can tap on? No. That's the control interface. Let's actually chuck some signals into it now. This took ages. So much to cover. So something that Rob gave me to play around with is this 40 picosecond rise time pulse generator from Leo Bodner. I think I'd read about this on the forum a while ago and it basically just plugs into the port and it generates a super fast rise time pulse which can help you to determine the actual bandwidth of the scope. In theory you can work it out. This runs with a USB power here, it's also got this port here which is a trigger out which could be handy I suppose. So we're going to put this onto port 1 and we'll plug into USB and we'll see what we get out of it. So there we go, we're seeing it on screen there. What I'm currently seeing down here the measurements is interesting. This is saying 3.3 nanoseconds, but this is supposed to be 40 picoseconds, which means that nanoseconds is probably the limit of the scope itself. If I bring this in, we see this rippling and stuff on there. So this is at, so it says 3.3 nanoseconds or so rise time, from 10 to 90 percent rise. And can I get a full time on there? I should be able to get to one now. 2.5 nanoseconds or so full time. 20 nanoseconds of vision, and this can also go down to picoseconds down here. That's interesting. So that is with one mega ohm input impedance. So let's go to 50 ohm. That will change things a little bit there, and we'll go up a bit further. Right. So we're now at 500 picoseconds of division. We can see the rise time of 200 and mm, average of probably about 280 picoseconds there. It's measuring just fine, even though it's not zoomed in. 270 picoseconds there, about 260 picoseconds here as a full time. Also, the 50 ohm loading makes a difference there. Right? Helps take ringing away and that sort of stuff. Now, can I make this better in some way? I actually don't know. Might just have a play with that. So, the other thing I'm just doing now is just playing with the acquire menu. So, I've got a fixed memory management which we left it on before. Let's go to fixed sample rate. See, it's sticking those lines up. Does that make it any better or not? Doesn't seem to. Doesn't seem to improve those rates at all. This makes the line a bit more blurred. I did try acquisition of peak detect. Didn't really change anything there. It's still looking basically the same, just maybe slightly cleaner actually. Okay. Um, 
ESR, I don't know what ESR is. It seems to be faster with the ESR turned on. I'd probably need to find out what that is. So this ball is also outputting 10 megahertz as well, in case you're interested. Shows the button just up there. So this rise time measurement, in theory, can tell you the bandwidth of the scope. Kind of, anyway, it gives you one aspect of the bandwidth. So in theory, this rise time I'm getting here, I'm seeing the, like, the best I'm getting here is probably 230 picoseconds maybe on the full time and maybe 240 on the rise time I'm seeing here. They're fluctuating around quite a bit, but that's probably the best I'm seeing flicking up. In theory, that 240 picoseconds gives a bandwidth of, I'm just looking now, about 1.5 gigahertz or so, in theory. So a 2 gigahertz scope, which is what this is, the rise time should be 175 picoseconds. Now there could be some factors going on there. Obviously, I've got this ball plugged in here, so it should be pretty good, but there could be some in things there with the ball itself, maybe. The interface, maybe the BNC is not great. Maybe the channel is not as good as some of the other channels. Or, you know, that should be pretty good though. But there could be some external factors here, which is meaning this is not quite where it should be on the rise time spec. Maybe if it's a different interface, it could actually achieve it, but I, d I don't know. But yeah, this is still pretty good. It's over a gig, you know, close to 1.5 gig in theory on rise time alone. We'll check the analog part out soon. So I've been changing different settings to see if I can get anything different out of it. And I haven't really been able to do that. I tried noise rejection, for example, see if that would help improve it. I haven't tried AC coupling, should try that, no difference. So I don't think there's anything here. Low frequency rejection, no. High frequency rejection, yeah, that's probably not a good thing. <laughs> Back to uh, DC. I mean, there's no real settings here I can do, even under the quite menu. I've already tweaked this a little bit, and I can't really see any way of improving these numbers here by changing settings at least nothing's obvious to me see I can make this worse <laughs> quite easily so what I've done now is come up with the channel 1 option over here obviously we've got a 200 odd picoseconds there we've got a bandwidth limit let's go down to 200 megahertz this should increase it, it has so we've now got about 2 nanoseconds showing up over here for rise time go over here to 20 megahertz and we're now getting about 20 nanoseconds rise time so now, just for shits and giggles, I've plugged in an external 50 ohm terminator. The rise time is now sitting at 1.5 nanoseconds. So that's going to show just how the input connection is also really critical. That's a 1 mega ohm. Put 50 ohm on there as well. That may actually tighten up a little bit. Um, yeah, it's back down to 200 again. But that's because I should be able to use 1 mega ohm on here, the 50 ohm on here, and have that work. But it's a compromise. The internal 50 ohm is far better. But now I've got 50 ohm and 50 ohm, which means it's probably 25 ohm. But uh, that doesn't improve that rise time at all. So it's actually chucked other frequencies into it and stuff like that. So I'm currently injecting a 10 megahertz signal, and it has modulation of 1 kilohertz on there. Um, AM 50% modulation, let's increase that to 90%, I'll just like 90% more. So in this mode, normally you could see on other scopes, you see a different pattern. This one here you can see it riding on the audio waveform which is a bit interesting right so I can bring it down there's the audio waveform right and here is the RF waveform and if I go into the memory management thing I've got a single a single sample rate or a fixed sample rate this is what we normally would see and this kind of display that's what we'd, we typically see so go into the fixed memory changes the way it behaves considerably so I've just dropped into eye diagram, and this is what we're seeing here. Looks familiar, doesn't it? If I bring the time base down, there is the audio waveform just in there. Obviously we're not triggering very well and that sort of stuff. Let's bring a graph, that will help slightly. All right, we're seeing the eye diagram like that. Is there any other set of stuff we can do on the trigger on this thing? I think we can. Hold off. Time hold off, and it's wind it up. This one, wind this up. Let's go 600 microseconds. There we go. I'll diagram of an AM modulated signal. Interesting. So let's just wind the modulation up and see what happens. So it's 100% modulation there. Bring the modulation down, that little gretch disappears. And trigger back down. A 7% modulation. We should exit that. Go back to normal view. 
back to this. So again, go back to the acquire menu here, and if we did that, we'd be greeted with that again. And if we reduce the time base down to the audio frequencies, there we are there. Let's bring the um, trigger up. Where is the trigger? There it is there. Okay. And back to fixed memory. That works the same way in those frequencies anyway. So that obviously has a quite a big effect on what you're seeing on the screen. ESR off. That's actually affecting that as well. So trigger menu back to hold off, which is currently set to none on this particular mode. Turn it on. We want call it six 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 microseconds. Let's go for that, shall we? <laughs> and yeah, there we go. That's all fine. I mean, triggering on this is no problem. This is a 10 megahertz signal, one kilohertz AM modulated. This is one of my standard test signals, currently 100%. Apparently, doesn't look like it's quite 100% to me. So now we can actually do some high frequencies on this thing. I'll turn the modulation off, and we'll see how this thing responds to high frequencies. Now, one thing to consider. We're using a BNC cable here that doesn't have the same quality levels as like a SMA or some of that, but this is what I'm using. It's got a BNC input on the scope. I've got an end to BNC connector directly on the output of my CMU200. We'll see how we go. It's a Pomona cable, so it's high quality cable as well. So I've got to set 100 millivolts because I can't actually get to 1 volt on this thing. Not the output, I'm going to do 13 dBm. It's just slightly shy of it. Well, in theory that should be 1 volt, but I'm not quite getting 1 volt because of the, the loading and what have you. We're not quite there on 13 dBm, it's just sitting slightly low. We'll go with this, 200 millivolts. So what we've got to watch out for then is going down to 70.7 millivolts or thereabouts. This should be out working fine. So I'm currently doing 1 megahertz, as you can see up here. And I shall wind the frequency up. So let's do 10 megahertz. IMS has dropped to 96. Interestingly, 50 megahertz. I do have noise ejection turned on. I'm sitting at 95 now. Now some of this could be my CMU200 because I don't normally do these frequency tests with that. I normally use my Marconi which is limited to 1 gigahertz but we plan to go above that today. This is a very noisy waveform out of this CMU200. I'm actually quite surprised. Look at that. I'm surprised by that. I can't do averaging. I don't know why I can't do averaging in high res. It's probably some kind of mode I need to be in to do that. Um, can I do fixed hyper rate? And then, can I do it then? Here we go, averaging now. That's a bit better, isn't it? That looks better. Okay, so averaging, this is going to be a bit of a better way of doing it, I think. 16 averages should be fine. So we'll do it this way instead. So, still 95 millivolts here, then we really change that. I'll give it down 1 meg just to be sure. 1 meg, and bring it down. You can see I've got this noise going on here. Something isn't very happy about that. <laughs> I think my CMU200 is not happy for some reason. 10 meg. Yeah, I've got some noise going on. True, that's what I'm looking for. Noise reject. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So, yeah, we'll do that. So, that's 10 meg. 1 meg. That's fine. I've got the noise reject turned on. It's working a lot better. Okay. 100 meg. Do some big steps. Still 95 millivolts there. Actually, I forgot to check something. I forgot to check the level again. 99, there we go, that's fine. Right, so 200 meg. Still 95. 400 meg. 92. Right, 600. Doing quite big steps because you can handle it. That's down to 90 there. Uh, 800. 85. So let's do 1 gig. 1 gigahertz, no problem. 81. All that noise has disappeared now. So it's all looking fine there. See 1.2 gig. So that's also sitting okay. 84 there. It's probably when I find out I've got my CMU 200's got a problem. <laughs> oh, 1.5 gig. And that jumped. Why did that jump? Huh. So I went to 1.5 meg. I'm an idiot. 1.5 gig. That's why I jumped. 81 to 1.5 gig. 1.8. Down to 75 millivolts. 2 gig down to 62. Now don't forget we're using a BNC cable, right? Even moving this around might change it slightly. Uh, you know, it's not ideal. But 2 gig, it's dropped off a little bit there, getting 62 millivolts. So I'll do 1.9, that's a 70 there. 
there we go, 1.9 gig is where I'm getting the 3db point. Now, don't forget, my setup isn't ideal, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if that is what's causing that slight difference between the 2 gig spec and what I'm able to produce. You know, I'm, I'm picking at like 50, 71 here, it's coming up IMS 71. But yeah, so we're doing 2 gig basically, and it is just about meeting the spec, barely with my not ideal test setup. So I think it will be doing it for just fine. Now I've got this set to 2.2 gig and I'm getting some interesting waveforms going here, look at this. See this one? It's not even anymore. I'm guessing that is issues with the cable. Reflections and stuff on the cable. Causing cancellations. So that's probably why it's not quite getting there. And that's a 2.2 gig. You can see the IMS levels dropped right down as well. So yes, definitely is not ideal. If I go to 1 meg, yeah. It's just completely opened up. So yeah, it's um, interesting. So 2.5 gig. It's just completely dropping off now. This cable connection is probably completely unsuitable for this frequency. <laughs> and it's above the rating on this scope anyway. 2.3 gig. There we go. It's back. It's there. And we can still expand the waveform out quite a bit. 2.3 gig. Nice. So now I'm going to try something. So the CMU200 at 2 gig again. Let's do auto setup and see how it handles it. There we go. No worries at all. And 61 millivolts. Like I said, it's really a little bit low at this very frequency here, but my setup is not ideal. So um, that's not surprising, as I said already. So after this really long review, I've got a few other little details on a cover. Literally. Now, we've got this Siglant cover here. Obviously nice to have a hard cover for the scope. Now, I was looking closely at this, being from a manufacturing background, I've noticed something which makes me slightly concerned about this cover. Let's move the scope out of the way a bit more. Obviously, this move this way, it goes like that. Right, so I'm just going to turn it around. So this bit here is actually on top of the screen. Right, so this is the screen area here. Now it's got this lump here, which is obviously there to help support it if it gets pushed. Now personally, I wouldn't want something pushing on the screen just here to help support it. It's held along the top, it's held along the bottom, and it's held along the sides. It's got these little ridges on the sides as well, right? So those should be sufficient to actually hold it in place and keep it safe. But having this lump here, this actually will rest against the screen, I think. I've done it like a height check across here, and it's almost the same height as the screen. It might be a very slight clearance. If there is a clearance, it is minimal. So I'd be a bit worried about this. If this were to get impacted and smashed, you know, get a big hit on the front, and it actually fractured the sides or something like that, and it caved that front end, which is possible, that would maybe not protect it like it should, because that will push against the screen as an impact point. And the other point is, if this were touching against a screen in normal use, I don't think it is quite there, but it's really close to it. Just here is the ejector pin. Let's get zoomed in a bit more. So this block here is inside the what's known as a moving half of the mould. And that round pit there is a ejector pin. So right here is a pin inside the mould, which pushes this off the mould during the manufacturing. I've just been injection moulded. It will push it out of the mould, and this is one of the places where it actually gets pushed out. Okay. Now, around this pin here, it's got a really slight raised edge as well. Now it's actually very slightly flashed on the edge of that pin. You probably can't see it on camera. I highly doubt you can see it on camera. Yeah, but that's actually creating a very slight sharp edge on that as well. So if this were resting against the screen, you'd end up scratching the screen with that section there. So what I think Siglant should do is actually just take this lamp off it Get rid of that lump. It doesn't need it. Get rid of it. It's just going to cause problems. Of course, that's just me being pedantic. It's going to be an issue if this happens to be on the scope as he gets a massive impact on the front. <laughs> Not that likely to happen, but this is a protective shield, and I suppose also a dust shield as well, really. I think that just should not be there. It's just a bit weird. Well, I hope you've covered enough. It took me hours to review this. Hours and hours. It's a really impressive scope, it works really well. There's a lot to do in it, there's a lot of stuff I still don't know about this yet. 
Rob did give this to me saying, spend some time with it, get used to it. Well, as the interface is very similar to the other scopes I've used, there's not that much getting used to. There's a few features in the actual coverage review which obviously I don't know how to use and I'm not likely to use them anyway. If you really want to know about these features, go and read the manual. <laughs> Seriously, there's only so much time I can have on this review and there's so much to cover anyway. I think I've covered it most of it anyway, things which most people want to use. If you're using these more advanced features, you're probably familiar with them anyway. So you probably have an understanding of how to use them when I don't have a clue in those particular cases. I shall pack this back up again and give it back to Rob. So thanks Rob for lending this to me and there'll be links down below if you're interested in finding more information about these things. It's big. <laughs> and the fan, which is in there, obviously you may have heard the fan. Obviously when it first powers up, the fan was quite loud and it scaled back down again. It's obviously temperature sensitive, so as it cools down, it doesn't need to run as so fast, so it doesn't produce so much airflow and gets quieter. So It's louder than my 2000X, which is currently running, sitting there, chipping away, because I compared that menu before. X Plus it is, not X. But yeah, it's still not that bad, it's tolerable. But I guess there's a lot of processing power going on the back of this thing, so it needs it. Catch you other videos out in the bottom there. Maybe consider becoming a patron to help support the channel. Maybe one day I could buy one of these things. And uh, <laughs> subscribe over here. Catch you later.